Okay. So we're moving along today to the Haftarot of uh, Sukkot. So let me let you in to the text. And here we are. So as we did in the case of Yom HaKippurim and in the case of each of the two days of Rosh Hashanah, we go back first to the uh, instructive and informative passage in the Gemara at the end of Masechet Megillah that advises on the appropriate Torah and Haftarah readings for the entire year. So it tells us, Yom Tov HaRishon Shel Chag, Korin Befarashat Mo'adot Shebetorat Kohanim. On the first day of the holiday, right, we read the appropriate passage in Sefer Vayikra that describes the three pilgrimage festivals. Note, of course, the highlighted word that uh, rather than calling the holiday by its proper name, Sukkot, the Talmud simply refers to it as the Chag, as the definitive holiday. Now, obviously, the Talmud was not discriminating amongst the three pilgrimage festivals and declaring Sukkot to be more festive or more important than the other two holidays, but it does seem that it distinguishes Sukkot from either Pesach or Shavuot, and let's just simply bear in mind that the Gemara makes this distinction, because we'll see um, an unfolding in the Haftarah where there is a rather particular reference to the holiday of Sukkot. And one of the questions that we'll ask ourselves is, why Sukkot and neither of the other two pilgrimage festivals? So for the time being, let's simply understand that when the Talmud uses the word Hechag, the holiday, with no other descriptive term, it is invariably a reference to the holiday of Sukkot. So on the first day of Sukkot, we read the Torah from Sefer Vayikra, Umaftirin Hine Yom Baal Hashem. And that is the Haftarah. And indeed, if you look a little further down on this same page, you can see indeed that the opening words of the Haftarah for the first day of Sukkot are indeed Hine Yom Baal Hashem, that the day of God, the day of the Lord will come. Unlike if you remember the Haftarah of Yom HaKippurim, which to which the Gemara referred not by its opening verse, but actually by its second verse. So here there's no question about what the Haftarah is. Now, um, remember that the Mishnah reflects the reality of the land of Israel in which only one day was celebrated at the start and at the close of holidays, while the Talmud, Bavli of course, reflects the reality of, uh, of the diaspora in which two holidays, two days were celebrated <clears throat> at the start and the close of holidays. Therefore, <clears throat> the Talmud now asks a question, Vihaidna, nowadays, that is to say, what does the Mishnah offer us, the <clears throat> Ikatreyome, who celebrate not one day at the start of Sukkot, but celebrate two days at the start of Sukkot. What is the Torah reading? So the answer, interestingly, is Lamachar on the second day of Sukkot, which in the diaspora is still a Yom Tov, Hachinami Karinan, you read the same thing that you read the previous day. However, when it comes to the Haftarah, there is a different Haftarah. Afture mai maftirin, but what is the Haftarah, the second day of Sukkot? Vayikahalu el ha-melech shalomo. It goes back to the uh, inauguration of the first Beit HaMikdash, when the people gathered in Jerusalem about King Solomon in order to celebrate the inauguration of the temple. And we'll get to that Haftarah next week. Okay. Usha'ar kol yemot hachag throughout the balance of the days of Sukkot, that would be what we call Chol HaMoheid, Korin B'Korbenot HaChag, since each day of Sukkot has its own different Korbanot, then on each day of Chol HaMoheid, we read that day's Korbanot. 
Then it comes to Yom Tov HaAcharon, and we'll pause at this point in the Gemara, because we will get to the Haftarot of the closing days of Sukkot later on. Okay. So, the Gemara prescribes that the Haftarah for the first day of Sukkot is Hine Yom Bal Hashem, the day of the Lord will come. Now, we all know that the day of the Lord is uh, a, a day that people look forward to with a mixture of anticipation and trepidation. The anticipation because Bayomahu Yiyah Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad, that is the day on which God will be recognized universally. The trepidation is because we know that it is also a day of judgment. So indeed, one might actually ask rhetorically, why don't we have this for the Haftarav Rosh Hashanah? Since Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, similarly, is a day that we approach with a mixture of anticipation and trepidation. It's also a day on which God rules, right? One of the three principal themes of Musaf is Malchuyot, God's reign. So, and indeed, it's a Yom Hadin. So indeed, there were reasons why, why the, haftarat, uh, the Haftarah of Rosh Hashanah uh, was as it is uh, the Song of Chana, uh, and not something from the later prophets that focuses on the Yom Hashem on the Day of the Lord. But here for Sukkot, it is appropriate, and again, we will see why as it unfolds. On that day, says the Navi Zechariah, and remember that Zechariah was one of the three last prophets. Okay? Zechariah, together with Haggai and Malachi, these are three out of the 12 so-called minor prophets, the Treasar, they were in fact the very last prophets, and the eras of their prophecies overlapped the closing years of the first temple, the duration of the Babylonian exile, and the initial years of the second temple. So we're dealing with where we are reading the words of a prophet who saw arguably the destruction of the first temple and the exile of the Jewish people to Babylonia, and nevertheless was able to see the rebuilding of the second temple. So he saw both destruction and he saw rebuilding. And this chapter 14 is the closing chapter in the book of Zechariah. So on the day of, of the Lord, on the Yom Hashem, v'chulak shlalech b'kir beich. There will be a, a division, there will be a, 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 a sharing of spoils. Now spoils is a very particular word. It's particular to a military context. Okay, spoils are not um, the ill-gotten gains of robbery. Okay, spoils specifically are what is taken from an enemy in battle. So if indeed there will be a sharing of spoils, then clearly this will be preceded by a battle. And indeed, that's the next verse. And you can notice that I highlighted in yellow a series of words that all have particular meanings in a military context, okay? Milchama, battle, okay? Uh, krav, a synonym for a battle. Shalal, the spoils that are taken in battle. And towards the end of this section, uh, lanos, nastem, to flee, which again is an activity that is associated, in this case, with the losing side in a battle. So the Navi says, v'astafti et kol agoyim el Yerushalayim la milchama. All the nations of the world will gather about Jerusalem to do battle against it. Notice again that I have uh, emboldened and uh, enlarged the word Yerushalayim because it too plays a very significant role throughout this Haftarah. Right? If you want to uh, either as a, an exercise afterwards or if you get bored during the class and you want to simply add up the number of times in which there are references in, in these 21 psukim to the city of Yerushalayim, by all means. So the nations will gather about Yerushalayim to do battle. V'nil ha'ir, and the city will be captured. V'nashasu ha'batim, the homes, the, the houses in the city will be destroyed. 
והנשים תשכבנה, women will be raped, ויצא חצי העיר בגולה, and half of the population of the city will be exiled, ויתר העם לא ייכרת מן העיר, but the balance of the population will remain in the city. So again, this may very well be a look back at the destruction of the first temple, those circumstances. And he continues in verse 3, V'yatsa Hashem, now just as the city of Jerusalem seems to be losing, God then will go out to battle. V'nilcham bago yemahem, and he will himself do battle against the nations that at the moment seem to be uh, seem to be um, victorious. Kiyom hilachamo biyom krav, and he will engage them in battle as a warrior. Right? Remember the pasuk that we say recite daily from the song at the sea. Hashem ish milchama. Right? He's a, a, a man of battle. Viamdu ragla bayomahu. Where will God position Himself on the day that He will do battle against the nations that have besieged Jerusalem? Clearly, if they're all surrounding Jerusalem, then God must be somewhere in the vicinity. So indeed it says, On that day, again, this, this Yom Hashem, this apocalyptic day, where will God station himself? On the Mount of Olives, still called the Mount of Olives to this very day, which is indeed to the very east of the city of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Okay. Mechetzio Mizracha. Half of it will somehow move further to the east. Viyama, and part of it will move further west. And thereby opening a Geigedolamaod, opening a great valley in between the two halves of the mountain. And once the valley is opened, it will be enlarged as half of the mountain uh, moves northward and the uh, remaining half moves southward. And what will happen to the people on that day? The people will flee into the valley that was created by the movement of these mountains. A very, very difficult phrase uh, to interpret, um, something about uh, the way that the valley of the mountains will reach a place, perhaps Atal is a place name, a geographical designation, and the flight that people will take on that day will be kasher nastem b'nei ha-ra'ash b'meuziyal melech Yehuda. It will be uh, similar to the way in which people fled from Jerusalem when Jerusalem suffered an earthquake during the days, the earlier days of Uzziahu, the king of Yehuda, which was somewhere around the year 720, arguably, BCE. So we're talking about reasonably 150 years previously. But we don't have to think back to that, although when I did this last week, I incorporated the verse from the book of Amos, who introduces himself um, to the people as having take has having um, uh, envisioned his prophecy bimei uzia melech yehuda during the days of king uziahu ubimei yaravan ben yorash melech yisrael and also uh, establishing his the time of his prophecy according to the kings of israel the king the northern kingdom and he says shnatayim lifnei haraash so the prophet Amos began his prophetic career two years before the earthquake. So clearly there was an earthquake during the time of King Uzziahu, which even 150 years later, people would still um, hark back to. Um, I wouldn't have needed to do this if I had, uh, Kuli had not known uh, what happened in Morocco uh, over the last several days. Um, clearly, um, you know, earthquakes happen, earthquakes happen lots of places, uh, and uh, occasionally uh, earthquakes are devastating. So clearly during the time of King Uzziahu, there was a particularly devastating earthquake, and uh, people, uh, although they could not have remembered themselves because they weren't alive at the time, but surely they had family traditions. If they were Jerusalemites, they had family traditions of how their ancestors fled from the city.
Now, as I said in my opening remarks, the day of God, right, Yom Hashem, is one in which we anticipate because that's the day on which God's uh, sovereignty will be established. And indeed, the second part of the Haftarah tells us that as a result of God's intervention on behalf of Jerusalem, when it is besieged by all of these nations, right, God's rule, God's reign will be recognized universally. Bayomahu again on that day, lo yihiyeh or yekarot v'kipa'om. There will be a change in nature. Okay, there will be neither light nor cold nor frost. Light here isn't so much uh, luminous light as it probably is uh, the light of the sun in a sense of heat. So it's saying neither heat nor cold. Either it means that there's going to be a a temperate climate or at least no extremes. And it will be a unique day, a day that now is unknown to us, but is known to God. Again, something that, you know, that we can speculate on, but we can't really describe accurately. As though just at the time of day, if you're guiding yourself only by a clock, and you said, oh, it's time for sunset, all of a sudden you'll be surprised, yihye or. Now, I don't mean yihye or in the sense that the sun will rise, because obviously if you're looking at your watch and anticipating sunset, it must be light outside. But yihye or probably here means that the light will endure, meaning the sun's not going to set at its an anticipated time. And another uh, sign of another natural omen for the day, if you're counting uh, references to Jerusalem, you might also want to count uh, references to the Yom, okay? It says, Now, I know that the, that the, the old JPS translation that you see here translates Mayim Chayim as living waters. Uh, I don't really know, how do you tell living water from dead water? Now, obviously, if one is clear and potable and the other is brackish and, and, and you know, so it's clear, but that doesn't really distinguish living from, living water here is a literal translation. They could have done a little better. Um, I would suggest that, that mayim chayim means flowing water, I don't even think it means sparkling water. I don't think that all of a sudden in Jerusalem, you're going to be able to open a tap and instead of getting plain water, you'll get seltzer. I, I, I don't think that's what it means. The Mayim Chayim means, means living in the sense of flowing, movement, flowing water, meaning Jerusalem, that stream of water will, will emanate from Jerusalem. Now, this is particularly significant because Jerusalem... Um, historically has been devoid of its own uh, water resources. You may remember from the uh, second part of the Book of Kings, one of the accomplishments of Chizkiyahu, right? uh, 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 actually was um, the son of Uzziahu, okay? that uh, when the city of Jerusalem had been besieged previously by the Assyrians, Okay? And they were concerned because the source of water for the city of Jerusalem lay outside the walls of the city, in the Gihon pool. So what Chizkiyahu did was that he sealed up the access the, to, the, to the pool that was outside the walls of the city, and he commissioned the digging of a tunnel that allowed people to access the well from uh, from within the city. So if the city of Jerusalem, which is notorious, as I said, for not having its own water supply, will on this Yom Hashem have a Mayim Chayim, will have a well, a spring with flowing water, then of course that too is a considerable change in nature. And the flow of the water will be so strong that one stream, so to speak, will head to the sea, which lies to the east of Jerusalem. The Chetziam, while another part of the stream, 
will flow al ayam ha'acharon, will flow to the sea which is to the west of Jerusalem, and it will flow year round. Bakayitz uvachoref yihiyeh, meaning it won't be rely, won't necessarily rely upon being fed by rainwater or by uh, melt from the uh, from the Hermon or mountains to the north, conveyed by the Jordan and then through aquifers and the like, but it will be a, 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 a source unto itself. And just as that well will continue to flow and will flow in all directions, so to speak, this is a representative or emblematic of God's reign, Bayomahu Yiye Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad. That again, God will be recognized universally. Um, of course, the sea that lies to the west of Jerusalem is none other than the Mediterranean Sea. The sea that lies to the east of Jerusalem would be the so called Dead Sea, which clearly, if it's now going to be fed by uh, flowing waters from Jerusalem, might actually be. Um, experience a triat uh, so to speak. The Dead Sea will come to life again. Okay. Uh, just a, a reference to one of the early French commentators, a uh, uh, Rabbi Eliezer of Beaugency, uh, commenting again on the significance of the, uh, of the uh, spring of water emanating from Jerusalem, that because there will be an earthquake, Yibaka'u heharim, right? Uh, rock formations will move. Ma'ayanot yeitzeyu. Meaning, it's not that the spring of water wasn't there before. It may have been there all along, but the, the effect of the earthquake will be to reveal it, to expose it. Okay? And in terms of the words kedem and achor, meaning uh, fore and aft, or Literally, kedem means in front of me, achor means behind me. Now, if you think about it, the only way that east can be in front of me and west can be behind me is if there is an assumption that everybody is facing in the same direction. And indeed, in the ancient Near East, that was a reasonable assumption. The assumption was is that in order for people to be able to tell directions, they would wait for sunrise. And once the sun began to rise, then they knew where east was and all the other directions are relative to it. And in fact, there is ample biblical evidence for that. For example, here we see that Kedem, east is called Kedem, literally in front of me. West is called Achor, literally behind me. And um, in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, a synonym for south is Teman. And the letters of Teman also spell the word Yamin. Teman means the place which is to my right, or the direction to my right. If you're standing facing east, of course, is south. And there are several places in Tanakh where instead of the word Safon, it uses the word Simol. If you may remember in Genesis 14, when Abraham um, pursues the four Mesopotamian kings, who were victorious in the battle on the plains and had taken his nephew Lot captive. It says, ad chova. He pursued them to a place called Chova, Asher Mismol le Damesek. Now, Smol le Damesek doesn't mean to the left of Damascus, because then it would depend upon which way you were holding the map. Smol le Damesek is not a relative term, it's an objective term. It means to the north. It also may very well be that when Abraham and Lot were divvying up the land between them, and Abraham said to his nephew, Im hasmol ve'emina ve'im ha'yamin ve'asme'ila, it could very well be, because we simply don't know where they were and what direction they were facing, he could have been saying right and left. But it's also possible that they were using the words yamin and small there in the sense of north and south. And by the way, you know, Yamin Usmo Tifrot, see the famous stanza in Lacha Dodi, which of course is borrowed from a verse in the book of Isaiah, okay? When it says that the city of Jerusalem will expand Yamin Usmo to the right and to the left, doesn't mean that it's not going to expand in the other two directions. 
It's simply a way, an abbreviation. So if you say north and south, then east and west are implicit in it. By the way, hiding behind all of this is a word that I have deliberately avoided using. And that is, what do you call the process by which you stand facing one direction and you want to know where the other directions are? You orient yourself. We call it orientation. Simply because to this very day, we assume that the easiest way in which to find the relative directions is to start out by facing east. Okay. And of course, as we know already, the city of Jerusalem will survive uh, this attack. It will survive the uh, apocalypse on the day of, of God, on the Yom HaShem. Yisov kol ha'aretz ka'arava migeva Rimon. All of the land will be like the Arava, all the way from Geva to Rimon, which are Negev Yerushalayim, which to the south of Jerusalem, the Ramah, right, the uh, Ashavat Teha, and all of this place will be settled and lifted up, okay, meaning that there will be arable land, all the way Lemishar bin Yamid and Mokom Shar Harishon, Ad Shar Hapanim, Migdal Hananel, Ad Yikveha Melech. Now, obviously, you need a, a, a guidebook for this, okay? Um, the prophet Zechariah clearly knew his geography of the city of Jerusalem, and he assumed that his uh, audience would be familiar with it also. Um, and indeed, these are all references to places in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, according to the sources that I consulted, and you see right it below, Shar Binyamin was in the northeast of the city. Shar Harishon was uh, in the northwest. Um, uh, Migdal Hanan El was to the north, and the Ikvei HaMelech were to the south. So again, by referencing these gates to the city of Jerusalem, he was effectively saying the entire city. Um, obviously, these gates do not necessarily correspond to the famous seven gates of the city of Jerusalem that have been in place only since the 16th century when uh, the Ottoman Turks under uh, uh, Suleiman uh, the Magnificent built up the city of Jerusalem, uh, at least the old city of Jerusalem as we know it today. But God's not finished. And we learn now that the nations who besiege Jerusalem will suffer as a result of their participation in the siege, and they will be stricken by a plague. This is a plague with which God will strike all of the people who participated in the attack on Jerusalem. Their flesh will be eaten away. But who made al raglav? It's simply a, a quick kind of decomposition, just as they're standing there. The inav timakna b'chorehem, and their eyes will fall out of their sockets. They will waste away in their sockets. Ulishano and their tongues timak b'fihem will again, again. So they'll 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 experience some sort of 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 physical. Um, destruction. Not only will they lose in the political sense, but they will also lose, they will be stricken uh, physically. Vayabayomahu, again a reference to that day, that the, the uh, tumult or the consternation with which God will inflict them will be great. They will hold each other's hands as though looking for assistance. And everyone, instead of holding hands as a sign of amity, as a sign of seeking their comradeship, they will instead turn against one another. And the Judeans will also take part in that battle. And the armies of the nations will gather about the city. Remember the opening verse talk about, about the shalal, about the spoils. So who we get some detail. The spoils consisted of gold and silver and fine clothing. 
וכן תהיה מגפת הסוס, not only will the people who participated in the battle be stricken with a plague, but even the animals will be stricken, the horses and the mules and the camels and the donkeys, וכל הבימה אשר יהיה במחנות ההמה, all of the animals that accompany uh, those, uh, those uh, nations, those tribes, במגפה הזאת will all be stricken in the plague. However, there is something they can do to avoid those consequences, and that, that of course is what makes this the Haftarah of Sukkot, is that God offers them a way out. And the way out is that they can celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. That anybody who was left from all of those nations who besieged the city of Yerushalayim, they should make an annual pilgrimage because he previously said therefore there is now as I said this universal recognition of God's sovereignty and therefore what will these nations do they have to come to Jerusalem annually in order to, uh, to display their recognition of God's kingship, the and lachog et chag ha sukkot, to celebrate sukkot. Vahaya, asher lo ya alemeet mishpachot ha'aretz el Yerushalayim, but any of the nations of the world who will not make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem, lishtachavot lemelech Hashem tzvaot, to show their, their obedience to God, what will their what what consequence will they suffer? Lo alehem yihiyeh hagashem. They will suffer drought. Now notice that I emboldened and enlarged the word geshem along with the words chagasukod because, as we know traditionally, there is a an almost inextricable link between the holiday of Sukkot and the phenomenon of rain. And that is that, no, we do not start to pray for rain on Sukkot, okay? The prayer for rain starts only two weeks after Sukkot. But what we do on Sukkot is we acknowledge that rain isn't just a natural phenomenon, but that rain is a function of our relationship with God. So when we insert the words, Mashiv HaRuach, he causes the winds to blow, Umorid HaGeshem, and thereby causes the rain to fall. When we insert those words into the Amidah uh, of Musaf on the last day of Sukkot on Shmini Atzeret, that is not per se a prayer for rain. That is an acknowledgement that God is in fact the source of rain. So there is this link between the holiday of Sukkot and, uh, and rain, and therefore the nations who do not observe the holiday of Sukkot, they will suffer the consequence of not enjoying the fruit of Sukkot, so to speak, which is the uh, availability of rain. Sorry, I'm sorry, and with respect specifically to the nation of Egypt, if they don't make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they don't come at all, then they too will, uh, will suffer these uh, consequences. Uh, this indeed will be the punishment of the Egyptians, as well as the punishment of all of the nations who don't participate in this pilgrimage festival to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. Why specifically the holiday of Sukkot? So there are a wide variety of opinions on this subject. So I have brought several of them, and then I'll uh, offer one of my own. So here we have the Talmud's opinion. 
It's not from the same tractate Megillah. It's from the Gemara Nasechet Avodah Zarah, very much at the beginning. It follows upon an, um, a piece of, of Agadot, of folklore, that maintains that before God offered the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, he offered it to other nations of the world who rejected it. Okay? So as a consequence of the fact that they rejected the Torah and the Jewish people accepted it, the Jewish people became God's chosen people and the nations of the world lost their opportunity. So the Gemara says that the nations subsequent to this will plead with God, offer us the Torah anew and we shall obey it. I mean, they basically said, oh, we didn't realize what you, know, what you were offering us. Um, if we were to, if we had a second chance at it, we would accept it. Okay. However, the Holy One, blessed be He, will say to them, "You foolish ones among peoples, I'm on the second line of the English, he who took trouble to prepare on the eve of Shabbat can eat on the Shabbat, but he who has not troubled on the eve of Shabbat, what shall he eat on Shabbat?" Meaning, you missed your opportunity. Okay. Nevertheless, God says to the Gentiles, I'll give you a consolation prize. I have an easy commandment, which is called sukkah. Go and carry it out. Okay? Meaning, I can't give you the whole Torah. I won't give you the whole Torah. But I'll give you one part of it. I'll give you a fragment of it that pertains to a holiday of sukkah. Easy thing to do. Okay? Uh, let's skip the parentheses. Okay? Um, so go down uh, a couple of lines, uh, right? Let's go down to the line that has the next uh, highlight on it, okay? Why did God make them this offer? He made them this offer because God does not deal imperiously with his teachers, with his creatures, okay? Uh, the Aramaic word is teronia, which is related towards the Latin word for tyrant, or tyrant, okay? God is not tyrannical. Right. Therefore, even though he gave the nations of the world an opportunity to accept the Torah and they rejected it, if indeed they came to him a second time and said, oh, please, please, please. So he was willing to, you know, to meet them part way. Now, why does he term the mitzvah of sukkah an easy commandment? The Talmud says because it's not, there's no chisron kiss, right? It, there's no great expense to it. I don't know if you've been online recently at sukkah.org to see what lately the price is of a sukkah, but I guess, you know, a, a kosher sukkah is not exorbitant. And, and I would say parenthetically, um, it's a good thing, uh, at least for, uh, for Jewish bookstores, that the Talmud here says only that sukkah is not an expensive mitzvah. It doesn't say anything about etrogim. Because if it had said that etrog is a mitzvah that can be observed without chisron kiss, without affecting one's purse, then I suspect that uh, a lot of Jewish uh, bookstores uh, would suffer as a consequence. But in any event, what is the, uh, the resolution of this? The resolution is, is that straight away, every one of them, that is to say all of the nations, will betake themselves and go forth and make a booth on top of his roof. They'll build a sukkah for themselves, right? But the Holy One, blessed be he, will cause the sun to blaze forth over them as at the summer solstice, meaning it's not at the time of year of Sukkot, okay? And when they go into the Sukkah and the sun beats down upon them, what will they do? Every one of them will trample down his Sukkah and go away. Okay? So the idea of offering them Sukkot was kind of like an empty gesture almost though knowing that they really weren't going to observe it. So that's simply the Gemara's uh, opinion. As I said, it's pursuant to the previous section that talks about the relationship of non-Jews to the Torah. And again, we have Rabbi Eliezer of Bojan C. He says, at the very least, meaning it's not that they're, that they're prohibited from participating in the other festivals, but if they can't make the festival, the pilgrimages on Pesach or on Shavuot, at least let them make the pilgrimage on Sukkot, okay? Ki Why? 
because she'asafu at ma'asehem in hasadeh. Because the holiday of Sukkot, the Torah calls it Chag HaAsif. It's the holiday on which we mark the conclusion of the harvest of the orchards. Therefore, whereas arguably during the time of Pesach, they're busy because it's the grain harvest, right? It's the barley harvest. And in Shavuot, they're busy because it's the wheat harvest. So they have an excuse. They can get a note from their parents. I couldn't go on the Aliyah La Regel because I was busy in my farm. But when it comes to Sukkot, there's no excuse because they will have already completed the, um, the harvest, the Chag HaAsif. Okay. Radak has a different take on it. He says, Sheba'oto zman tiyah ha-milchama v'yera'u nifla'ot ha-boreyit barech midei shana b'shana l'zichron oto hayom. Radak seems to feel that in fact the Yom Hashem, this apocalyptic battle, will take place on the calendar in proximity to the holiday of Sukkot. So this, in fact, will be, as it were, their first opportunity to observe it. Okay. And uh, Rabbi uh, and, uh, Ovadia of Sephorno, a later medieval uh, exegete, uh, says, um, because what is what is Sukkot symbolize? Sukkot symbolizes Kiva Sukkot Hoshavti, God's uh, um, providential treatment of the Jewish people in the wilderness. Meaning, since it symbolizes, it were, God's providential treatment of the Jewish people, it symbolizes the fact that they will have no fear of their, of their, non, of their Gentile neighbors. So as it were, the observance of Sukkot today is a harbinger of the messianic era. Shelo yitztarchu lechomot ir lo mivtsarim. Almost though saying, I can go out and live in a booth because not only do I not need a house, I certainly don't need a city, I don't need barricades, I don't need ramparts because God will protect me. The two concluding verses of the Haftarah reverting again to Bayom Ahu on that day, Yihiyel mitzilot hasus kodesh l'ashem that, uh, that even horses the bells on horses will be inscribed with the words Kodesh Lashem to indicate that they recognize God's sovereignty. And all of the utensils in the temple will again all have this, this sacred status. Again, as though every single pot and pan in Jerusalem will testify, as it were, to God's sovereignty, so that anybody who comes to offer a sacrifice in the temple, will be able to have his choice of any of the utensils that he wishes in which to bring his sacrifice, because they will all be recognized as sacred to God, they will all be hekdesh, and they can all be cooked in, so that anybody who previously um, had a, 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 a housewares stand outside the city of Jerusalem to sell pots and pans to pilgrims, right, clearly is going to have to look for another line of work. Now, just simply to summarize, Um, the first entry here, just out of curiosity's sake, is um, uh, the uh, reason I found uh, in uh, the uh, chat GPT for uh, the connection between the holiday of Sukkot and this Haftarah. It says the Haftarah for the first day of Sukkot is about the Jewish people celebrating eternal national peace. That's pretty good. The storyline of this week's Haftarah is that half of Jerusalem is captured. Zechariah predicts that a day will come when the war of Gog and Magog will take place. Gog and Magog is obviously confusing Zechariah with Ezekiel, but there are other similarities that we'll note in a moment. Thus, to answer our question, the relationship of the Haftarah to Sukkot is the theme of preparation. The Haftarah details the preparation for Hashem's presence to rest in the Beit HaMikdash, and similarly, our experience of Sukkot and entry to the Sukkah depend upon the spiritual preparation of Yom Kippur. Okay. Um, if you know who introduced H-A-S-H-E-M 
as a substitute for God or the Lord, then you'll be able to figure out where the generative artificial intelligence got this paragraph from. And just simply in contrast, from a Chabad website called First Days of Sukkot, Haftorah is in a nutshell. Again, uh, it's pretty much the same. But I want to say just something about the Yom Hahu, about this, this notion of this day, this apocalypse. Okay. So again, as I told you, this Parak Yodale, the 14th chapter, is the concluding chapter in the book of, uh, of uh, Zechariah. So it's his final apocalyptic vision, and he describes how the Mount of Olives, Harazetim, will split open to form a valley due to an earthquake, revealing new sources of water. And here again is a different translation. In that day, fresh water, right? Not living water, but fresh water shall flow from Jerusalem, part of it to the Eastern Sea, part to the Western Sea throughout the summer and winter. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord with one name. The latter verse is well known from the daily liturgy. It is interpolated into the conclusion of the Song of the Sea in the Prishacharit Sukei de Zimra, and again at the conclusion of the Aleinu prayer at the end of every single service. But I want to go back to the earlier verse. First, let us recall that a very similar picture was drawn by the prophet Yechezkel, who wrote again, you see the citation, I found that water was issuing from below the platform of the temple. So that both Yechezkel and Zechariah, who remember, are roughly contemporaneous. Okay? They're both living in this period of time between the destruction of the first temple and the rebuilding of the second temple. And they're describing something in the future using very, very similar terms. The idea that Jerusalem will have free flowing water. Okay? Now, what I brought is Abrabinel's commentary there on this verse in the book of Yechezkel. And I alluded to it previously. From time immemorial, there was a shortage of water in Jerusalem. Therefore, at the time of salvation, in order to transform Jerusalem into a source of universal blessing, God made it omnisufficient, meaning it can take care of itself in all respects. No scarcity by creating a spring of living water whose source was beneath the temple. The purpose was that all the world's inhabitants should recognize that nature had changed for the better. That a dry as wood flinty rock had been transformed by God into a wellspring and that the miracle would occur in merit of his temple. This would be a sign in Omen that Mitzion Tetze Torah Udvar Hashem Yerushalayim and to indicate that God had created something new upon the earth, so that in Jerusalem, that had never had spring water, a wellspring would emerge at the time of salvation. And I say again, Zechariah, whose career overlapped with that of Yechezkel, incorporated the same symbolism of Mayim Chayim, of flowing water into his prophecy, even to the distribution of the water into the eastern and western seas, the Mediterranean, and to the Dead Sea, so that it will indeed experience, as it were, a return to life. I close with a rhetorical question, what surer sign of Yeshua, of salvation, can one anticipate than the rebirth, as it were, of the Dead Sea? Okay, I have a look at the chat. Um, mm, I see there's no post the sources. Uh, I, I will, um, you know what, if I give me one second, if I have, if they sent them to me, I can post them right now for everybody who is here. And I assume that otherwise, you'll just simply have to look for them on the Torah and Motion website as They're you... in the email with the link. Oh, they are? It's in this morning's email. Oh, excellent. Fine. Thank you. So that uh, I, I uh, uh, think. No, I don't think this is not it. So I don't have it right now. Apologize. Okay, let me go back here before we run out yeah. of time. The link is in the morning email. Everyone just has yeah, to look there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Robert, yes. Can I well, then, uh, if I just may, I see somebody posted this. So let me just uh, run. The, the, the title I gave to this series initially was the Haftarot of Tishrei, the whole month, from Hannah's prayer. That was the first day of Rosh Hashanah to the skin of the Leviathan by way of Rachel's tomb. 
So we've already covered Hannah's prayer. We've covered Rachel's tomb. Obviously, one of the Haftarot or something that we still have to cover will somehow tie us into the skin of the Leviathan. So that's something to look forward to. Trust me, the skin of Leviathan is definitely worth looking forward to. Um, what else am I going to see here? Uh, there's something else. Uh, somebody did post the sources. Okay. Yeah, Abraham used the terms Yamin was small. That said, Geva to the north in Binyamin. Um, well, uh, it depends. If it's Givat Shaul rather than Givat Binyamin, then it isn't so much to the north of Jerusalem as it is to the west of Jerusalem. So it, it's really difficult when, as I mentioned last week, when we were talking about, or two weeks ago, when we were talking about the word Ramah, when it's ha rama with a hey ha yidiyah with a definite article, then we can presume that it is a specific rama. But when it's just simply rama in the indefinite, as here geva in the indefinite, it's really difficult to know which geva it, it intended. I have my own uh, thought on why Sukkot is opposed to Pesach and Shavuot, and that is that I don't think that that the uh, vision of the Acharit Hayamim, the vision of the end of days uh, of the prophets, um, is one in which everybody is going to be Jewish. There will be universal recognition of God, but not necessarily that everybody is going to become Jewish. Therefore, I think that the difficulty with observing Pesach and Shavuot is that Pesach and Shavuot are not merely quintessentially Jewish, they are idiosyncratically Jewish. Only the Jews experience the liberation from Egypt. Only Jews receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. Whereas Sukkot is not particular. It, there's nothing really particularistic about it. Yes, I know. In the wilderness, the people stayed in Sukkot. But the truth is, anybody who travels in the wilderness will stay in a Sukkah instead of staying in a, in a permanent residence. So whereas the holidays of Pesach and Shavuot are, are idiosyncratically Jewish holidays, there's no expectation, I, even in the eschatological future, we don't expect non-Jews to observe them. Sukkot, however, has this not particularistic, maybe even built-in universalistic dimension to it, right? The rain and the crops, etc. And therefore, it's perfectly reasonable to expect even non-Jews to observe it. And with that, unless there are some questions, yeah. I leave you. Uh, can I ask a question, Rabbi? Please. So um, I'm seeing a connection for the first time because of your shear. Um, I'm seeing a, a connection now to the um, to, the, uh, to uh, Hannah, to Hannah and the, and the uh, Shirat Hannah and the whole drama that we went through through Rosh Hashanah's Torah, because if all of this is rejuvenation, if the Dead Sea can come alive, this is really opening a womb. And her prayer, uh, well, her two prayers, you know, the first one in chapter one of Samuel, and then the second one, were all about God can do the unnatural. God against nature is no contest. God can open a womb here. God can make the desert uh, filled with rain. God can redirect Mayim Chaim under Jerusalem. In other words, these things seem to be recurring, just depending on the prophet. Yes. Hannah had her sovereignty prophecy, and uh, Yechezkel and Zechariah have their prophecy. But don't you see that? Do, am I wrong? I mean, I'm seeing that really nice connection. You can find you can find the birth connection, uh, even in other aspects of it. Um, arguably, um, Yonah. Whoa! Right? Nice. Uh, right, Jonah. Um, and if you think about it, uh, Noah. Yes. Uh, Noah and Jonah clearly. I mean, that's not not my not my my original right. Hebrew. I mean, <laughs> Noah and Jonah, you know, birth uh, both as it were, you know, emerged to new life from within something in the water. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know that that that's clearly that's clearly you know Please. there, and yeah. it makes sense too because you know Noah is Genesis too. Right. I mean, Noah, you know, the, the destruction of the world um, reverses the order of creation and the emergence of Noah from the ark, you know, repeats the order of, of creation. So, you know, everything in, in this in this part of the year, everything's part of the year, again, is rebirth, rejuvenation, uh, etc. And I said, but but always remember, uh, it's the anticipation, but anticipation fraught with anxiety. 
because mm. we aren't really certain that it's going to happen, not because God isn't capable of it. Our uncertainty is due be to the fact that we're not certain that we are, that we merit it, that we're well, eligible for it. Well, that really depicts Hannah completely. I mean, she was on the ground in the temple crying her eyes out. And I can I ask a question? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Um, Rabbi Sokolov's um, connection has frozen. Oh dear. I don't get to ask my question. It's gone. The connection is very tenuous. Yeah, well, he may, it, it, it's possible he'll be right back. Ah, oh, David. David Las Vegas. No. no the host. There we go. Here he is. <laughs> On mute. Okay. Right, Sakhalov, you're, you're totally. Not, so, okay. I, I, see, I just experienced just experienced either rebirth or rejuvenation. <laughs> nice. And I asked, now that you're back, can I ask right, a question? Else. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, the one thing that I found a bit strange was when it said that if Egypt didn't come to Sukkot, it would be punished by having no rain. And yet we read all the time in the Torah that Egypt doesn't need rain because it's got the Nile. So it seemed a rather useless punishment. Oh, I think miraculous punishment, because if they don't need it generally and then the rain uh, and then they're they become. Uh, yeah, well, the, remember, the, 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 yes, I mean, they they didn't they didn't they they were able to irrigate from Nile water, but they were dependent on the Nile to the same extent that in the land of Israel, you're dependent upon, you know, a meteorological rain. Um, you know, if it doesn't rain, if it does, if Lake Victoria doesn't fill and the red and blue Niles don't fill, then the Nile doesn't have water. You know, so I, in in a sense, it's all the same. You're right. I, not not it's not as immediate as it is in the land of Israel, but nevertheless, it's still part of the same phenomenon. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, this is Judy Sokolow. First, I'd like to say hello to Mrs. Rapport to my cousin Shoshana, but hello. I would also like to hi. I would like to point out that I just read, maybe others did too, if uh, my husband mentioned uh, the uh, earthquake in Morocco, that the Jewish community there was pretty much spared as were the etrogim, because I think uh, we know that many of the etrogim that we sell that are sold are, come from Morocco, and they're okay for what it's worth compared to the destruction. I'm sure the price will go up, not the same. Probably. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Ktiva Vachatima Tova to all and Chag Zameach and see you next week. Thank you. Excuse me. Can I ask you one thing? Thank you very much. Quickly, please. I've got another one. Go ahead. Um, I wrote in the chat. Hello. So when it says that all the Goyim will come up, is that why they have that parade in Yerushalayim today, up till today? You, uh, know, you got me. I don't know what you're referring to. There is a parade in Yerushalayim. Yeah, yeah around Sukkot time of many, many evangelicals and Japanese and people, they yeah, march right. through the streets with flags. I, I, I assume that it is. I assume indeed that that's the origin of it. I, I'm not acquainted with it. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.